Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kendra and today we're going to talk about everything I knit in January. So I have some notes which is an important thing to share because I actually recorded this entire video yesterday but I was run down, my energy levels were not great and I did absolutely no preparation so I didn't take any notes and after recording it occurred to me that I left out a bunch of things that I wanted to say so this time I am equipped with notes so that I make sure I can say all the things that I want to say about the things that I knit this month. So today is January 31st. It is officially the last day of January and I have officially survived an entire month of not buying yarn. So if you watched my previous two videos, you might be aware that I've committed to not buying yarn for the entire year of 2023. Obviously, it's the first month of the year, so there's not going to be a lot of opportunity, in my opinion, for me to really feel the effects of the commitment that I set for myself. So I'm not necessarily feeling any urge to buy yarn, if I'm totally honest. I've been perfectly content working from my stash for the past few weeks. and. I suspect that feeling is going to last um, well into the spring. So maybe at the halfway mark of the year, I'll talk more about how I've been feeling and if I've been um, tempted to buy anything or anything like that. But for right now, I'm perfectly content working through my stash. It's been really nice to see my yarn collection shrink a little bit and it's been really gratifying to finish projects. So enough about that. Let's get into what I made this month. Let's get started with the first finished object that I completed this month, which is my salty sweater. So here she is in all her glory. In yesterday's video, I was actually wearing this sweater, but it was honestly quite hot. I have a large light here that gives off a bit of heat, so I didn't want to put myself through that torture again. So we're just going to have to hold it up and imagine it on my body. I do have some pictures and video footage of me wearing it, so I'll definitely overlay that so you can get an idea of how it fits. But it is a pretty simple pattern. It's a top-down drop shoulder design with a fair amount of positive ease in the body. Um, it has two by two rib on all of the trim. So the cuffs, the hem here, as well as this mock neck. And the pattern calls to do a tubular bind off on all of the edgings. So I've never done a tubular bind off on two by two rib. And I think it looks really nice. I think it was worth the extra steps and I'll probably do that on future projects. It does feature a little bit of short roll shaping um, at the shoulders, but other than that, it is a very, very straightforward shaping wise. And yeah, I really think it turned out wonderfully. So the yarn I used, I'll pop in a picture of the label and a better picture of the yarn itself. I really love it. So I got it from Woolen Folk last year back in October and it is by a company called Studio Dog Fibers which I believe is a small farm based yarn company. From what I can tell online they don't have much of a presence. There was nowhere that I found that I was able to purchase this yarn online. So it may be one of those things where you have to go to the local yarn store um, close to the farm or in that area to get your hands on it or find a fiber festival that they might be vending at. But I'm really excited that I was able to try the yarn because this is definitely one of the yarns that I purchased during Rhinebeck weekend that I realized wouldn't be easy to come across. So it feels as a result like a really special sweater and I'm glad I was able to make it. What I love about this finished piece I really like the overall silhouette. I love the amount of positive ease that I get on my body. As I said, I love the yarn. It's a very beautiful color um, and 
there's some heathering but it's very evenly distributed across all of the skeins i didn't have to do any alternating skeins or anything like that i'm curious to know what the sheep look like that produced the fleece that went into this yarn but i'm sure that's something i could get around to finding out through some googling and this yarn also had quite a bit of little floofy bits not necessarily tweed i don't think you would consider it that but maybe some inconsistencies with the way it was spun and there's just a lot of floofs they kind of look like pills you probably can't see it on the camera here but i went back and forth at the, as i was knitting this about whether or not i wanted to pick those out or leave them in i decided to leave them in um, and I don't think they're that noticeable anyway, so I am I was happy to do it. Oh, it's very, very warm. So, which could be a good or a bad thing. I think what I'm realizing is as I knit more sweaters and as I sort of realize that I have more of a preference for fingering weight and DK weight sweaters. This is a DK, granted, but the wearability is definitely a factor. So this sweater is light and airy, which I love, but I think because of the fiber and the non-superwash um, wool that's knit into it, it is very warm. And I definitely overheat easier than most people. So perhaps for a yarn like this in the future, I would opt to knit a cardigan as opposed to a pullover or maybe something that has some way to ventilate and not make it so hot. So maybe knitting it at a looser gauge or choosing a pattern that features a lace motif or choosing something that is a v-neck as opposed to a mock neck so that my skin can breathe a little bit more. So I don't anticipate being able to wear this um, except for on days where it's super, super cold and probably not to a place like work where I prefer having layers, for example, so that if I get too warm or too cool, I can swap layers. This isn't really conducive to that. I can't just strip off a pullover at the office. So that's something that I sort of took away from this project for sure. The other thing that I don't love is, believe it or not, the cow neck, which I think is the main design feature of this pattern, because otherwise it's a very simple, straightforward drop, so drop shoulder design. The cow neck is not my favorite feature, primarily because of comfort. So I don't like things high up on my neck. I don't like woolly things super high up and close to my neck for extended periods of time and especially because the sweater is already so warm the cow the the mock neck sort of just adds another element of warmth that kind of takes it too far over the edge in my opinion so i'll keep it the way it is for now but i am going to revisit potentially modifying it in some way so either taking the collar as is and tacking it down and turning it into a folded collar or frogging a few, a couple inches and redoing the bind off so that it has a shorter, more like a mock neck as opposed, not, more like a cow neck as opposed to a mock neck. So that's really the only somewhat negative thing that I have to say about this. And it has nothing to do with the designer or the pattern itself. It's just really me learning what my preferences are and what types of sweaters make the most sense in my wardrobe. Other than that, I could not be happier with how this turned out and I anticipate making more versions of this and maybe tweaking around some of the details. Like, I think this would be cool as an oversized sweater dress. I think it would be cool as a crew neck as opposed to mock neck. I think it would be really easy pattern to add some type of texture to the main fabric. I could swap out the two by two rib for one by one rib. I could play around with the amount of ease and on and on and on. This is one of those sweaters that not only can become a wardrobe staple, but I think it's simple enough that it is very, I guess, easy to impose modifications or tweaks. Um, it's a good, blank slate of a sweater that is 
really conducive to modifications. So I'm looking forward to making more versions of these in the future. Probably no time soon, but as I finish this, it definitely got the wheels turning a bit. So we may see more of this pattern in my sweater collection. So that is the Salty Sweater. The next finished object I have to share is actually a cowl. This is the Gruggle Cowl by Kate Davies. And I used another small farm yarn similar to the Studio Dog Fibers in my Salty Sweater. This yarn is by Mabia Crafted and the yarn line is called Welcome Home. It is 100% Michigan grown BFO Romney wool and it is 250 yards per 100 grams and the colorway is called Mary's Lamb and this colorway is undyed. So that's what the label and logo looks like. I also purchased this yarn at a fiber festival. So my fiber friend Felicia and I went to the Glen Ellen Arts and Fiber Festival um, last summer and I picked up two skeins of this yarn and with no project plans but eventually I stumbled upon this cowl and I decided to go for it. It was a little touch and go at the start because I was concerned that, and I'll give you a close up. This yarn is another heathered yarn, again, undyed. So the finished yarn is gonna have some variation in terms of not only color, but texture. And it's also a very dark color. So I was a little concerned when I started this cowl that the texture would get sort of lost in the yarn itself. And I was a little nervous that it would be kind of pointless to knit such an intricately textured design in such a dark heathered yarn. But if you have eyes, I think you would agree with me <laughs> that the pattern is absolutely not lost. I think it shows up perfectly well. I think the yarn itself, it is kind of tightly spun and it lends itself well to some really good stitch definition. And I think this yarn would be beautiful in cables, for example. And this pattern motif is achieved by doing a twisted stitch. It's completely charted. It's not written. But yeah, I, I have no regrets now that it's finished. But as I was knitting it up, I was concerned that the pattern would get lost in the yarn. And I was also concerned that the gauge was too tight and it would turn out like a cardboard cowl instead of a drapey fabric cowl because one thing that the pattern calls for is to knit the first part of it in one needle size the gauge needle size before going up a needle size for the bottom part of the cowl and the reason it's designed that way is that so it flares out and it has a bit of an a-line shaping towards the bottom so that it can fit more nicely around the shoulders and under a coat because one thing i don't like about the idea of cowls granted this is my only my second one that i've ever knit but i don't like the idea of the fabric sort of bunching up at the base of the neck right where your coat meets your shoulders and there's just a lot going on in that area and i think by um loosening the gauge at the bottom of the cowl this combats that issue perfectly so i'm happy with the overall fit and i think it's very functional it served its purpose very well yes the gauge at the top is tight but as you can probably see in the video it has not compromised in drape so it's drapey it's very comfortable there's no itch whatsoever which i'm really grateful for and because the gauge is so dense at the top um, it makes it very warm, almost windproof. So when I'm wearing it, it is effectively keeping my neck and chest very toasty. I wore, I've worn it probably every day since knitting it a couple of weeks ago and I, there's no turning back. This is my favorite winter accessory that I've ever knit myself. This is just perfect. So the third and final finished object that I have to share today most of you might consider this not a finished object and instead a half finished object but for the purposes of this video i'm calling it a finished object because for me it um fulfills the goal that i set for myself at the beginning of the year and that is to knit 
one sock a month for the year of 2023 so that at the end of the year I have six completed pairs of socks to add to my collection or to gift. And yeah, I finished my January sock. It's a very straightforward sock, um, one by one rib at the cuff, two by two rib along the leg and the top of the foot, a slip stitch heel flap, standard gusset, standard wedge toe. I have not wet blocked this, but I have put it on the blocker for this video because it looks all scrunched up and weird if it's not on a blocker, so you're welcome. I'm using Cascade 220 to knit this. And actually, fun fact, I am killing two birds with one stone on this project because as I am knitting the yarn into this sock, I am simultaneously frogging the yarn that went into this scarf or what's left of it. So I cast this on, it's the Dryad by Jared Flood for Brooklyn Tweed. And I cast this on as a gift for my dad, a Christmas gift for my dad. But I decided it was a little bit too ornate and I don't think that it's quite his style. So I kind of switched gears and I instead knitted him a cabled hat that he really liked and actually specifically requested. So as you can imagine, I bought enough yarn for this scarf and potentially a matching hat set. So I have quite a bit left over. Um, I think I have two untouched skeins in addition to what I have here. So this project has been a good opportunity to use up some of what's left of this Cascade 220. I have not cast on the second sock yet. I'm going to wait until we're officially into February. So in the meantime, I have a couple of other whips that I have been working on. So I'll share those with you. Oh, before I forget, I used the rye pattern, uh, rye sock pattern by Tin Can Knits, uh, specifically for the stitch counts and the gusset instructions and the heel turn instructions and the toe instructions. But everything else about it is kind of my own thing. So this doesn't at all look like the rye socks as written but the key sort of construction elements i use that pattern to create this sock so yeah okay so let's talk about the whips that i have as of right now so the first whip on my needles at the present moment is the sideline shawl this pattern is unreleased and I am knitting it as a test knit. That was the wrong side, I apologize. I am knitting it as a test knit for Allison Schmidt of Allison Marie Knits, I believe is her handle on Instagram. And it is a fingering weight garter shawl that will be diamond shaped. I am still working on the first half, so I'm in the increase section. And the second half is going to be a symmetrical decrease section so imagine this being half of a diamond the yarn i'm using is hudson and west weld in the color tobacco and Patton's croy socks in the color i don't remember but my project page is going to have it once the pattern is released but this is what they look like together this has been a really good opportunity to stash bust because I kind of had tentative plans for each of these yarns, but nothing really committed. So I had no problem repurposing them to knit this pattern because my application to test this pattern was completely spontaneous. And part of me thought she wouldn't even pick me, but she did. And here we are busting some stash. So this is what it looks like. The pattern is, I believe, only written for one size, basically, and it calls for two 100 gram skeins of each color. Um, each of the yarns I'm using come in 50 gram skeins, and I have two skeins of each, so it's perfect. And um, once I complete the main section, there's going to be an applied eye cord edge that I pick up and knit in the respective contrast color. So the Hudson and Weston tobacco, which is this color, is going to be the edge on this side. 
and then the croix socks which is this color is going to be the edge along the other side and the pattern is written with an optional um, additional color blocking situation so once I knit the first half I have the option to swap out the colors and then continue the second half of the diamond um, with the color swapped but I think I'm going to keep the colors the same on both halves and just continue up in this pattern. This is the first time I've knit intarsia. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> the problem with that is that I have two sweaters planned this year that mainly feature intarsia throughout the entire main fabric of the sweaters. And so I am faced with the potential reality that I may have to revisit those plans and do something else in place of those projects. Or, and this is a sort of a best case scenario, I power through and I knit them anyway, but I won't go into the project with any misconceptions about intarsia and how it is to knit it because now I know and I won't be disappointed. I'll just kind of know what I'm getting myself into if that makes any sense. So I could go either way at this point. I'm really not in a place to cast either of those projects on. So I kind of cross that bridge when I get there, but it, defini it definitely got me to thinking about those intarsia projects that I have planned and how um, the breaking news is that I don't like intarsia. So we'll see how that goes. I think one thing that's working in my favor when it comes to those projects <laughs> is that I am definitely a product knitter, which means that my main motivation for casting on any project is to have the finished object. And I'm not necessarily super into the idea of knitting for the sake of knitting or knitting for the experience or knitting because I think a skein of yarn is cool even though it's not something I would wear. Everything I knit for myself is because it's something I'm going to wear and I think as a result I've been very satisfied with my knitting practice but sometimes for me that means enduring techniques that I don't particularly find enjoyable compared to others. But in the end, I'm in it for the finished object. So I always have to keep that goal in mind. And that is definitely coming into play here because I don't find intarsia too enjoyable. But I will say it is getting easier as the rows get longer. It was quite fiddly at the start and I was convinced I hated it and I even considered bowing out of the test knit because I could not endure it. But as the shawl grew and I had a little bit more fabric to work with, it got a little bit more bearable. So who knows, by the end I will be a, an intarsia loving freak. But right now, at this point, I'm kind of indifferent more on the I don't like it side. So at the moment I have two whips and this particular whip is serving a specific purpose for me. Well actually a couple. So one this is my house whip. So at all times I have both of these colors attached to the shawl and so it is not a very portable project for that reason. Add to that the fact that it is less than half the size it's going to be. So it's going to get quite a bit larger as I get closer to the finish line of this project. So it doesn't lend itself very well to travel knitting or commute knitting, which is something I like to do. So I have another project that I'll share that is serving the commute knitting purpose. But this is the sit at home, watch TV, chill out, watch some knitting podcast type of knitting. Nothing too extravagant but it will keep my hands busy and it'll make me feel productive. So I appreciate having this project in the rotation for that reason. And the other reason I am knitting this is because I needed something to do between now and casting on my ward sweater. So if you remember in my 2023 knitting plans, I talked a bit about my plans to knit the ward sweater as a 
casual knit along with my fiber friend Felicia. She is working on a project now that, that has a deadline attached to it. So much to my disappointment, she is not yet ready to cast it on. So I've had to keep myself occupied until she is ready. And I don't think I have enough of a window to knit an entire other sweater. So in the meantime, I have been really into the accessories knitting and this call for testers sort of came at the perfect time. So I am happily knitting away on it in the meantime. It's definitely keeping me busy. And I think when it's finished, it'll be a really wearable shawl. Um, I don't think I'll wear it as a shawl draped over the shoulders. I'll probably just wear it as a scarf shawl situation wrapped around the neck a couple of times. And I think the colors are really appropriate for the fall. So I can picture myself wearing this with a denim jacket and some crisp white sneakers and some black jeans. I don't know, is that fashion? Either way, I am going to be happy to have this completed, hopefully by Valentine's Day. That is the deadline I'm giving myself, but I think the official test deadline is February 16th. So basically Valentine's Day. So that is my sideline shawl test knit. Last but not least, we have my travel whip, my commute whip. <laughs> it looks so funny. These are the Manhattan Mitts by Tori Yu of Tori Knits NYC. And I cast this on for a couple of reasons. One, I'll actually show you. Whew. I'm putting myself on blast here. I have had this pair of gloves for years probably at least four years potentially longer and i love them they're super warm they're touch screen this past winter they have all of a sudden just started to completely decompose and just fall apart and uh this is what we're working with here They are peeling like nobody's business. They have seen better days for sure. And this started to happen maybe three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. And I figured I should probably start a pair of mittens so that I have some type of cold weather hand coverings. Um, so this uh, cast on is primarily out of sheer necessity. This is a one by one ribbed mitten pattern and it is written to include instructions for both a fingerless mitt, which as far as the hand is concerned, I would probably bind off about here, as well as a full mitten that covers the entire hand. Um, it's knit on like a 3.5 millimeter needles with worsted weight yarn. So it is knit up at a pretty dense gauge, which I think is necessary for an accessory like this that you want to be as close to windproof as possible. Ooh, I think it's fun that it also sort of matches my Gruggo cow. This is not the same yarn. So this is Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool in the Nature's Brown color. I believe. Here's a closer look at what this yarn looks like. If you're familiar with Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool, this is not the put up that it comes in. It comes in these ginormous, like 250 gram oblong skeins of yarn that are not very conducive to the commute knitting that I needed this project for. So I wound them up into a few cakes here so that it would be more portable. So that's why it looks like that. Um, but yeah, so far, so good. I ca the, today is Tuesday and I cast these on, I cast this on Sunday actually while I was cafe knitting with my fiber friends. And yeah, it's coming along really nicely. I anticipate finishing the first mitten probably by the end of this week for sure. And then I'm going to cast on the second one right away. 
I just hope that it is effective at keeping my hands warm. I'm a little concerned because knit fabric by nature is holy and not necessarily wind and weather proof. And I know that this is knit at a tighter gauge and it's non super wash wool and it's a rustic wool and all those things I think are working in in favor of making this a warmer mitten. But for example, today it was like three degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if these are three degree Fahrenheit type of mittens. So I, even when I make these and I wear them, I may find that I'll need to supplement them with a more insulated pair of hand coverings for the colder days, say below 15 degrees, for example, which was the kind of day today was. So we'll see how effective they are at keeping my hands warm. That's really my only main concern with this pattern. But so far, I think they look really nice. They fit nice and snug. And yeah. One modification I am considering doing, I have not fully decided yet, but I'm toying with the idea of knitting the full mitt on the fingers, but leaving the thumb tip open so that I'm able to use my phone. Part of me thinks that's a little bit counterintuitive because I'll have a really cold thumb <laughs> when I wear them. So I don't know if I'll actually follow through with that, but it is, it's an option because one thing I do appreciate about these raggedy gloves is that I can use the touch screen. I'm really going to miss having that with a pair of mittens like this. So I might leave the thumb tip off. I might knit the thumb long enough and I just won't close it so that I have the option of folding the thumb down and using it on my phone and then sliding it back up when it's not in use. So that way it's not just completely exposed all the time. Or I may just knit the thumb covering as written and just have a proper pair of mitts have not fully decided on that yet but so far it's working up really quickly um one by one rib at such a dense gauge is taxing on the hands so i don't think i'm going to be cranking these out left and right but i think that dense gauge is really going to make this a super effective pair of mittens so yeah these are the Manhattan Mittens. Oh, also Tori is doing, the other reason I cast on this specific pair of mittens is that Tori is doing a Manhattan Knit Along. So she has a family of patterns in the Manhattan collection. She has the Manhattan Hat, the Manhattan Hat Light, the Manhattan Hat Bulky, and the latest addition to that collection of patterns is the Manhattan Mittens. And I actually have two of the three Manhattan, how many times can you say Manhattan? Manhattan, Manhattan, Manhattan. I have two of the three hats in the pattern collection and now I have the mitts. So I think that's a really fun and cool thing, especially for knitting like matching accessories. So my battery is dying. Okay, so those are the Manhattan mitts and those are all the whips that I have this month. That, or that or I'm flustered. That is everything that I knit in January 2023. I didn't buy a yarn, so yay, 2023, no buy. If you liked what you saw, you want to see more content from me, subscribe. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.